he will also be tomorrow night's respondent. And momentarily, he's going to come up and say a word about um, Bob Herman and uh, the Herman Lectures and the format, uh, and also introduce today's respondent, uh, Randy Isaac, who is also going to give the formal introduction today. So did you get all that? There are going to be there are going to be three people before you get to the main course, but I'll be I'll be very brief. Uh, Dr. Alter is currently the chair of the department. His main interests include American and British intellectual history and the history of science in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, I'll note uh, uh, just a couple of his publications, uh, Darwinism and the Linguistic Image, Language, Race, and Natural Theology in the 19th Century, and William Dwight Whitney and the Science of Language, both published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, more, re more recently, he is the author of an article, Darwin and Language, appearing in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Darwin and Evolutionary Thought. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming our MC and Master of Ceremonies, Steve Alter. Thank you, Tal. I'll send you that payment very soon. <laughs> Welcome to the Robert Herman Lectures on Faith and Science. First and foremost, we would like to recognize Dr. Bob Herman and his wife, Betty, in whose honor this lecture series was founded. Bob and Betty are right here near the front. As Tal mentioned, Gordon College is partnering with the John Templeton Foundation to honor Bob Herman's pioneering work throughout his distinguished career in addressing the big questions surrounding the interface of science and religion. Bob is a former adjunct professor and pre-med advisor here at Gordon College. He taught biochemistry for 22 years, first at Boston University and then at Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma. In 1981, Bob left medical education to become executive director of the American Scientific Affiliation. Here, just a word about this organization. The American Scientific Affiliation was founded in 1941 as an international network of Christians in the sciences. Its 2,200 members explore ways to integrate science and faith. Gordon Science faculty have long been involved with this organization, and so students should know about it as well. Through his work with the ASA, Bob Herman met Sir John Templeton, with whom he collaborated in writing several books, including The God Who Would Be Known and Is God the Only Reality? And here we should add a word on the late Sir John Templeton. A devout Christian, Sir John made his career in financial investments and in philanthropy. It's estimated that in his lifetime, he gave over $1 billion to charitable causes. That legacy continues through the John Templeton Foundation, of which Bob Herman is a founding member. The Templeton Foundation funds interdisciplinary research exploring the interplay of science, human purpose, and ultimate reality. And one of their good works is the lecture series that we enjoy here today. Each year, the Robert Herman Lectures invite a major thinker to develop an original perspective on a topic at the threshold of science and religion. The format of, this three, of the three lectures is three lectures over three days. Each day, the main presentation will last approximately 45 minutes. Next comes a 10-minute response. And finally, we'll have question and answer with the audience. We will aim to finish shortly, shortly before 6 PM each day. Introducing our speaker for this year's series is Randy Isaac, who will also give the response to today's talk, as Tal mentioned. Randy received his bachelor's degree from Wheaton College and his doctorate in physics from the University of Illinois, after which he worked for the IBM Corporation, serving most recently as IBM's Vice President of Systems Technology and Science. Randy is currently the Executive Director of the American Scientific Affiliation and is also active with the BioLogos Forum, a community of evangelical Christians committed to exploring the compatib compatibility of evolutionary creation and biblical faith. Let me bring up Randy Isaac. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Randy. And I can't really begin 
this lecture series without uh, giving my great thanks to Bob Herman for a long-standing friendship going around with me to ASA chapters all across the country talking about Let There Be Light, Modern Cosmogony, and the Biblical Creation. Uh, and we collaborated on the possibility of a television series that, alas, never came to be. But nevertheless, the thoughts and the ideas in working that out have seeded a number of my talks. And so I'm very grateful to Bob for his shepherd, shepherding me around all those places and the many lively discussions we had in the process. I remember, in particular, one time when he was with me down at Rice University, and we got the message that a group of people were coming with the intention of walking out the moment I mentioned the word evolution. And so, I worded my talk very carefully, <laughs> using every possible alternative expression, until I finally got to the evolution of red giant stars. They were flummoxed. They didn't know if that was the time to leave or not, and they got stuck with staying for the whole lecture. <laughs> All right. The first was Copernicus Wright. For many years, I've puzzled about the nature of science and its theoretical structures of explanation. What gives science the ability to make predictions? In 1705, Edmund Halley predicted that a bright comet he had observed in 1682 would return again in 1758. And if it happened, he said, he hoped that candid posterity would notice that it had been first predicted by an Englishman. He, he was lampooned for placing the date uh, of the comet's return well after his lifetime so that he would not have to face public scorn when it didn't appear. But the comet did return and has borne his name ever since. And there have been many later astronomers who envisioned planets around many distant stars, though they had little hope of actually verifying this. Today, with the recent Kepler mission, uh, Direct evidence for this prediction has been attained for thousands of extrasolar planets, or exoplanets as they're called. In another field, biologists concluded that the ancestors of whales lived on the land. And today, paleontologists have found hundreds of skeletons of early whales that still have vestiges of legs. Or, in physics, you've all heard of the massive search for the so-called Higgs boson a prediction that was finally fulfilled this past year. This uncanny ability to make such a coherent picture of physical and biological world has now allowed science to reign at the top of the tree of knowledge. This has not always been the case. Five centuries ago in Western civilization, theology was considered the queen of the sciences, that is, the queen of knowledge. So, what is the epistemological relationship between science and theology today? Are they separate magisteria, each going their own way, entirely unrelated? This is a major puzzle, and one I do not expect to resolve. Nevertheless, it is a central puzzle that I hope to address in these lectures, gradually circling, circling around the issues from a historical perspective. The subtitle of this first lecture is, Was Copernicus Right? Nicholas Copernicus was, of course, the Polish astronomer who introduced the earth-shaking heliocentric cosmology. And I think nearly all of you would agree that his cosmology was right. A few of you might suspect that I have a perverse reason to answer no. And a few others may very well hope I will simply say yes, he was right, and sit down. Either response would, of course, lead to a scandal, perhaps something like the near riot that greeted the first performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which took place exactly a century ago. And of course, you wouldn't want to miss that. But then again, if 
Copernicus's cosmology was right, why did it take a century and a half before a majority of educated people accepted the idea that the earth moved and the sun stood still? So that is the particular puzzle facing us today. First, we should look briefly at the astronomy involved and then at the cultural and theological milieu into which it was thrown. Let me begin by introducing Copernicus. He was a contemporary of Columbus and of Martin Luther, two other personalities who reshaped our worldviews. Young Nicholas came under the patronage of his maternal uncle, who was making great strides in ecclesiastical politics and who became Bishop of Varmia, the northernmost Catholic diocese in Poland, a post in authority and power comparable to being the governor of the province. Nicholas was elected a canon of the Frombork Cathedral in Varmia, which meant that he was one of the 16 members of the cathedral chapter, that is to say, the board of directors. Never ordained as a priest, he nevertheless took minor orders and had charge of one of the cathedral alders. His uncle sent him to Italy to study law and medicine, two areas of interest to the diocese. As a graduate student in Italy, Copernicus was in Bologna on the same day as Leonardo da Vinci, though it's unlikely that the eminent artist met the aspiring young canon lawyer. Even as an undergraduate in Krakow, Copernicus had taken a keen interest in the stars and planets, and he had armed himself with a few basic books in astronomy. Remember that the printing of books was not even 50 years old. Had he lived a century earlier, it would have been far more difficult to obtain the sources he needed for his reform of astronomy. While in Italy, he had boarded at the home of Domenico Maria Novara, the university's astronomer, and while there, he had made some of his earliest preserved observations. The astronomy that Copernicus studied at Krakow and then in Italy was geocentric. That is, the Earth firmly fixed in the center of the cosmos. Now, today, if we wanted to calculate the position of Mars with a very rough approximation, we could use two circles. One, the orbit of Mars going around the Sun, and the other, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, and we could connect them by some sim simple trigonometry. In Copernicus's day, based on the ancient Ptolemaic system, there were also two circles, one going around the fixed Earth and the other called an epicycle riding on the first circle. From the point of view of geometry, the basic calculation was the same, whether you used the Earth as the center uh, as your fixed reference point or the sun as the center. The goal was identical, to know where to look for Mars as seen from the Earth. It was just mathematics of uh, combining those two vectors uh, and that's how you would be able to make the calculation. Now let's just look. You could get there an another way. You can shrink down the size of the sun's orbit because all that matters here is the distance, the direction, not how far away it is. And so if you knew where the position of the sun is, well, it looks as if our uh, computing system has given up. I, I invite the technicians to come and fix it while, <laughs> while I march on with my text. Suppose you were a student at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow in 1492, and someone came along and told you that the sun is really a lot bigger than the earth, and therefore the sun, not the earth, should be at the center of the universe. And furthermore, it didn't make any sense for the entire cosmos to spin around the Earth every day. You would no doubt have been told to get lost and to take all that nonsense with you. If the Earth was whizzing around the sun, 
and spinning on an axis every day, a thousand miles an hour, uh, we would surely just be spun off into space. Think how much harder it would be to walk west than to walk east. Totally ridiculous. When I described Copernicus's heliocentric cosmology a few minutes ago as earth-shaking, the adjective was deliberately chosen, for not only did it defy common sense, but it was soon to run up against Psalm 104. Here we go. Are we on it? Are we on it now? Uh, not yet, but we've got to get past this. There, that's it. Now, now you see that uh, you can see the way in which you can move it to get the sun in the middle of the system, and then you can eliminate that epicycle. You're doing it still with two circles, just as in the Ptolemaic system, and now you switched into a sun-centered system, and that is how Copernicus made the Earth a planet and essentially invented the solar system because that was uh, the arrangement whereby the sun was central to it and it was a solar system. But now the problem with Psalm 104. The Lord my God fixed the Earth on its foundation so that it never can be shaken. For all these reasons, Copernicus was very reluctant to publish his radical ideas, though he had spent years not only working through all the mathematics, but assembling the specific observations needed to show that some of the parameters describing the planetary motions had changed slightly since the days of Ptolemy, and some had remained the same, and yet they could all be fit into a sun-centered system. But Copernicus, as he himself put it, feared that he would be hissed off the stage. There the matter rested as Copernicus neared the age 70, when remarkably, a young teacher from the Protestant University of Wittenberg, Georg Joachim Reticus, turned up on his doorstep, begging to learn what Copernicus had accomplished. Reticus's brief visit of a few days soon extended to weeks, then months, and finally to two years. He persuaded Copernicus to publish, and eventually took the precious manuscript to Nuremberg, where it was finally printed in 1543 under the title of De Revolutionibus, or On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. Copernicus himself received the final pages on his deathbed. It was a hefty tome, 400 pages, rivaling Ptolemy's Almagest, the only comparable treatise. So, what was its impact? Let me reset the clock from Germany in 1543 to the British Isles in 1970 and invite you to join with me on a school holiday family trip from Cambridge, England, where I was on a sabbatical leave. En route to Edinburgh, Scotland, we stopped in York so I could consult with a colleague, Jerry Rabbits, who, like me, was on the committee to plan the forthcoming international celebrations for the 500th anniversary of Copernicus's birth in 1473. And we ask ourselves that very question. What was the impact of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus? Now, a dozen years earlier, the German-American novelist Arthur Kessler had published a history of astronomy entitled The Sleepwalkers. As he later confessed, he had been upset by the fact that virtually all German schoolboys knew the name of the Italian Galileo, but few could identify Johannes Kepler, the German astronomer who had discovered the elliptical form of the planetary orbits. So he deliberately set out to write a book to redress the balance. As a novelist, he was prone to see the world in terms of good guys and bad guys, and thus, in The Sleepwalkers, Kepler took the role of the good guy, and Copernicus and Galileo were the bad guys. In particular, he branded De Revolutionibus as the book nobody read and an all-time worst seller. On that evening in York, Rabbits and I 
asked ourselves who might have read Copernicus's book in the 16th century. And we counted fewer than a dozen names before we ran out of ideas. And then our conversation drifted off to other matters. In Scotland, two days later, while Miriam and our sons explored the Edinburgh Castle, I delved into the fabulous collection of rare astronomy books at the Royal Greenwich, Royal Edinburgh Observatory. And there I discovered something truly astonishing. It was not just a first edition of De Revolutionibus, but a copy filled with mar marginal annotations by a reader who had worked his way through the entire opus, highlighting key passages, explicating complex sections, and finding a scattering of small errors. If this book had so few readers, what was my chance that the very next copy I saw would bear the weight of heavy and perceptive reading? It just didn't add up. With a pounding heartbeat, I looked for clues as to the identity of the annotator and eventually noticed, impressed into the binding, the initials ER. You can see them up there. Jackpot, I thought for these matched a name from our list of probable readers. Erasmus Reinhold, the professor of astronomy in Wittenberg, colleague of Redicus and a leading astronomical pedagogue of the 16th century. In my excitement, I grabbed a sheet of paper and made a rubbing of the initials in the binding. E-R-S appeared on the sheet. Wait a minute, where did that S come from? That let all the air out of my balloon. With respect to early books, I was a mere adolescent, but I was a fast learner, and it was only a matter of days for me to find out that ERS was exactly what I should have expected. For in those days, the town of one's birth was part of one's identity. Erasmus Reinholdus Salveldiensis was the Wittenberg's professor's full appellation and the mysterious S stood for Saalfeld, the town of his birth. The serendipitous discovery of Reinhold's richly annotated copy of De Rev provided a window into the way a skilled 16th century astronomer looked at Copernicus's unorthodox cosmology. In fact, he essentially ignored it. But more than that, in a moment, Finding this spectacularly annotated book ignited a quest to see what the margins of other copies might obtain, a possibly quixotic search to examine all possible surviving 16th century copies of De Rev, a series of globe-trotting journeys extending over 35 years and tens of thousands of miles. One result was a detailed census of 600 copies, and the other, was a memoir ironically entitled The Book Nobody Read, whose last words are, Arthur Kessler was wrong, dead wrong. <laughs> the editor thought that was overkill. Uh, in other words, every astronomer who took his occupation seriously was very likely to have had and to have read a copy of De Revolutionibus. Still, Arthur Kessler was a clever, educated man. How could he have been so wrong? And this is part of our puzzle. The very long time it took for a majority of educated persons to accept the heliocentric cosmology. An overwhelming majority of us agree that the Earth is going around the sun and not vice versa. We know the sun is a mass of incandescent gas, very different from the planets arrayed around it, or as Copernicus had put it in his soaring cosmological chapter, the sun, seated on a royal throne, governs the family of stars that wheel around it. Surely, Kessler must have reasoned, if scholars actually read the book, they must have promptly seen the light, and since widespread adoption of the new cosmology didn't happen, it must have been a book that nobody read. It apparently never occurred to him that scholars read the book and just didn't believe it, that it applied to physical reality, how things really were. Let me take the case of Erasmus Reinhold and his thoroughly annotated De Rev. 
The technical passages bristle with his calculations and commentary, but the sparse cosmologi cosmological chapters have scarcely any annotations. On the title page, where we might expect to encounter a comment such as, this author stops the sun and throws the earth into a dizzying motion, we instead find the cryptic motto here at the bottom of the title page, the axiom of, ast of astronomy, celestial motion is uniform and circular or composed of uniform and circular parts. Here is a very different aesthetic, a golden rule for the approved technical geometry of the individual parts, not a grand unifying vision of the entire system. And in Copernicus's vision, it was a unified system. What he realized was that the entire entourage of the planets automatically arranged themselves so that the planet with the shortest period, Mercury, orbited closest to the sun and lethargic Saturn rounding the sun in 30 years was farthest and all the rest fell rhythmically in between. There was something irresistibly beautiful about this layout. Furthermore, this arrangement explains something that was simply a mystery in the Ptolemaic astronomy. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn periodically stopped in their eastward progress against the background of stars and moved westward for a few weeks, the so-called retrograde motion. Why, was, uh, why did this always happen when the planet was directly opposite the sun in the sky? This was simply a fact of nature, a fact in itself, as Aristotle would call it. Ptolemy couldn't explain it, but Copernicus could. In his sun-centered arrangement, the retrograde motion opposite the sun was required, now a reasoned fact. This arrangement provided a conceptual system. Copernicus had invented the solar system. Reinhold's Wittenberg colleague, Redicus, said that all these motions were bound together as if by a golden chain. Stray, unreasoned motions had now had a common cause. It was beautiful, an aesthetic vision. Redicus even wrote an essay arguing that the new system was compatible with the Bible. Reinhold, on the other hand, was a conservative. He was nevertheless enthusiastic about Copernicus's restoration of astronomy, but with his fresh observations and recalculations, and Reinhold worked diligently to bring out the volume of tables based on De Rev. Yet, these prutenic tables were carefully constructed to work independently of the cosmology. They helped to popularize Copernicus's name, but a geocentrist could use the tables without feeling a heliocentric twinge. Uh, undoubtedly, Reinhold would have subscribed to the sediment, sentiment of Tycho Brahe, the great Danish astronomer two generations later, who wrote that Copernicus's system nowhere offends the principles of mathematics, yet it throws the earth, a lazy, sluggish body unfit for motion, into a motion as swift as the ethereal torches, that is, the stars themselves. And even Copernicus realized that his system had a serious Achilles heel. If the Earth was really whizzing around the sun, there should be a parallactic effect on the observed positions of stars. You can readily uh, observe this effect by holding your finger and looking at it with one eye and then the other eye and seeing how it switches back and forth against the distant background. Stars should do that too, if you observe them in June and then in December, uh, a different position of the Earth as it goes around the sun. So vast, you don't see that. And Copernicus said, so vast without any question is the divine handiwork of the almighty creator. That is precisely how he ended his soaring cosmological chapter. But in the decades that followed, serious evidence was brought forward that the stars were not all that far away, and therefore Copernicus's heliocentric cosmology could not be sustained. Serious evidence 
but flawed as further observations eventually demonstrated. While the Copernican story is often told as the search for stellar parallax, I think this is a red herring. Among other things, the heliocentric cosmology was generally accepted by educated persons a century before a convincing stellar parallax was finally established by Friedrich Bessel in 1838. Yet for a century and a half after De Rev was published, that is, until around 1700, it was not widely accepted. Clearly something deeper was at stake. It was, I believe, the very gradual abandonment of an entrenched worldview, what C.S. Lewis has perceptively described in his wonderful scholarly book entitled The Discarded Image. <clears throat> the Discarded Image is splendidly epitomized in a late 14th century Italian painting by Piero di Puccio in the Campo Santo, or burial hall, that, a sta that stands across the green from the Pisa Cathedral and its famous leaning tower. Galileo must have walked through the hall many times when he was first a student and then an assistant professor at the university there. And there, in the Campo Santo, he would have seen the early Renaissance cosmos, a surviving medieval tradition stunningly and colorfully frescoed on the wall. Piero de Puccio's masterpiece depicted a tidy universe, the earth in the center surrounded by the planetary spheres and beyond the stars, the Dantesque layers of the Empyrean, saints and angels arrayed wingtip to wingtip and holding all in his arms. God the creator. Puccio's universe mirrored the beliefs of popes, professors, and peasants, of merchants, monks, and mendicants. His cosmos was orderly and beautiful. Cosmetics shares the same roots. But most satisfying of all, its dimensions were comfortably human. Millions, billions, or trillions were not part of its vocabulary. After nearly six centuries on the Camposanto wall, Puccio's fresco was shattered on the 27th of July, 1944. A casualty of World War II, the painting was smashed to the floor in a thousand fragments. Somehow, the demise of the Camposanto fresco is a fable for our times, for just as surely as that image was shattered, so was the concept it reified. Gone today, is the closely bounded stage on which the great Western monotheistic religions framed their cosmologies. In its place is a vast cosmos in which the Copernican arrangement is, it was the opening toxin. They put as many of those thousand pieces together as they could. You will see the current status of it with large gaps where the where it wasn't possible to completely replace it. Puccio's fresco was not a unique portrayal. For example, Hartman Shadle's great illustrated coffee table book of 1493, well, maybe they didn't have coffee and coffee tables then, uh, but extra the extravagantly illustrated bestseller included full page illustrations of the days of creation ending with the magnificent view of the central earth encircled by the spheres of the moon, the sun, and the planets. Outermost was the ethereal sphere of heaven with the elect, all enwrapped in God's arms. In the four corners of the woodblock, there are four winds, quite possibly cut by a young apprentice named Albrecht Dürer. These two examples are just the tip of the iceberg as far as contemporary knowledge of the nesting of spheres is concerned. What you have just seen is the cross-fertilization of a scientific idea with a theological picture. And this entanglement then became a very conservative force when the scientific ground began to shift. I want now to trace the scientific idea of fitting all the planetary spheres into a compact arrangement and show you how it provided a powerful background motivation to Copernicus's radical cosmology. 
The bottom line that will emerge from my three lectures is that science, working within its own magisterium, is far more tangled with a humanistic or theological vision than we might expect, and that the magisteria are more overlapping than we might idealistically suppose from a strictly scientific perspective. But let me turn once again to the historical evidence. Nesting the planetary spheres goes all the way back to Ptolemy, and he may have picked up the idea from Aristotle. During the late Middle Ages, it received further impetus in a work called the Theorica Planetarum, reputedly from Gerhard of Cremona, a learned translator in Seville in the middle 12th century, and ki but quite possibly from one of his mentors. In any event, it stemmed from Arabic sources that had preserved Ptolemy's idea. In the middle of the 15th century, shortly before Copernicus was born, a Viennese professor named Georg Feuerbach updated the work under the title Theoricae Novae Planetarum, that is, a new theorica of the planets. Not a new theory, but a clearer presentation of the nesting idea, or theorica. The fall of Constantinople in 1453, 20 years before Copernicus was born, brought an influx of Greek-speaking churchmen into the Italian peninsula. Included was Cardinal Vasarian, who brought to Rome a Greek manuscript of Ptolemy's Almagest, and who was looking for a knowledgeable scholar who would learn Greek and undertake a Latin translation of this classic work. Feuerbach and a younger scholar, also at the University of Vienna, Regio Montanus, accepted uh, Bessarion's challenge. Like Mozart, Feuerbach died in his 30s, leaving Regiomontanus to complete the task. Regiomontanus, who turned out to be the greatest mathematician of his century, was a Renaissance man of great vision, and he saw a revolution at hand, coming about because of the invention of printing with movable type. Responding to the challenge, he set up himself up in Nuremberg as a printer, and among other things, he published the first edition of Feuerbach's Theoricae Novae Planetarum in 1472. And that's Montanus's printing of it. It's hand-colored, as all of them were. Unfortunately, he too died before reaching the age of 40. The publication of the epitome of the Almagest lagged behind, and it was at last printed in 1496. And very shortly, it became an essential reference source for the young Nicholas Copernicus. Meanwhile, Feuerbach's Theoricae Novi was reprinted repeatedly and became a standard text for university students. None of this has any obvious connection to Copernicus's heliocentric idea, except that in the Regio Montanus Feuerbach epitome of the Almagest, there is explicitly shown the parallelogram transformation that connects the geocentric and heliocentric geometry, which I showed you in the animation a little while ago. And that was of direct use to Copernicus. But I suspect there's a more subtle connection to Feuerbach's Theoricae Novi. Unfortunately, we don't have a major archive of Copernicus's papers as he worked through his astronomy from geocentric to heliocentric, but we do have his autograph manuscript of De Revolutionibus as well as an early short draft of his heliocentric system, the so-called Commentariolus or Little Commentary dating from around 1512. In it, he lists a series of starting points, and one of them is that he detests the so-called equant, a mathematical construction adopted by Ptolemy to model the variable speed of the planet in its orbit. We know today that this is an amazingly good approximation to what is called Kepler's law of areas. So why was Copernicus so put off by it? I have been puzzled for by this for several decades ever since I began to look at Copernicus's mathematical mechanisms in some detail. The answer, I now believe, was lying in plain sight all along, 
just like the purloined letter. Let us look closely at Copernicus's diagram of his heliocentric system, here shown in his working manuscript of De Rev. The sun is at the center, and the planets are ranked around the sun in the order of their periods of revolution. Mercury, Venus, the Earth with the moon, Telurus cum Luna, and Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. An equant for each of these planets would require another sphere whose center, in the case of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, would lie on top of the mechanism for Mercury. What a confused mess that would be, something to be avoided at all cost. And this is precisely what Copernicus manages to do. The, organ, the diagram, perhaps surprisingly to modern eyes, does not show orbits. Instead, like Poirbach's Theorica, it shows zones, zones that can easily accommodate the mechanism for making the planet move faster or slower. And here, there's enough space not just to have the Earth, but to have the Moon as well. <clears throat> these, are the zo these zones become particularly apparent when we notice that the Earth with its Moon is included in the third zone. Here was now a compelling harmonic arrangement for those with eyes to see it, everything tidy, and not spilling outside its own zone. This was the deeply aesthetic judgment that brought Copernicus to his radical cosmology with its well-stacked harmonic arrangement. Now, traditionally, there has been some prejudice against accepting a theory on the grounds of its aesthetic appeal. But such an appeal was to a considerable extent in the eyes of the beholder. A pious Lutheran or Catholic could have felt that nothing could be more blessed and beautiful than a closed universe surrounded by the ethereal heaven with God the Father, the angels, and the elect. Besides, it was ridiculous to think of the earth spinning at a thousand miles an hour. However, to Galileo, it was not clear that the motion could be felt. And in any event, he stated that he could not admire enough those who accepted Copernicus's ideas despite the evidence of their senses. And then there had been the Englishman, Thomas Diggs, who in his perpetual almanac for 1576 had included an emporium for the elect among the heavens, a compromise between Copernicus's vast universe and a place for the hereafter. It was the first published diagram to show the stars extending beyond a thin sphere. Oh, here we are with Thomas Diggs' stars going out to infinity, and in the caption going around here, it says, this is for the, the habitacle of the blessed with innumerable stars of shining light. <clears throat> All of these ideas tiptoed around the circumstance that as the 17th century began, there was no physical evidence in favor of the heliocentric system beyond its unifying aesthetic. Arthur Kessler's notion that simply no one had read Copernicus's book was scarcely a credible explanation for the failure of the widespread adoption of the heliocentric cosmos. Now, many of the more important breakthroughs in science have been major unifications terrestrial and celestial physics in the case of Newton, electricity and magnetism by Maxwell, space and time by Einstein, and so on. What was holding up the adoption of that wonderfully unified planetary system of Copernicus? It's fascinating to examine the opinion of Tycho Brahe, a true giant among observational astronomers of all time. He knew that Copernicus, half a dozen decades earlier, had made a powerful unifying step, but nearly everyone supposed it was just a hypothetical construction. Yet, standing under the stars with his amazing instruments, night after night, he must surely have decided that he was looking at something real, 
and not just imaginary constructs. But it seemed unreasonable for this heavy, sluggish earth to be moving so swiftly. And furthermore, it was surely unbiblical because of Psalm 104 and other similar passage that extolled the stability of the earth. So whenever he condemned the motion of the earth, he always listed physics first and the Bible second. The Bible. By our standards, that's in a completely different magisterium. Tycho shows us how overlapping the magisteria can be. Today, nearly every introductory astronomy textbook carries two proofs of the motion of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth on its axis is demonstrated by the changing plane of the swing of the famous pendulum, first swinging publicly, first swung publicly by Leon Foucault on a night in February 1851. The re revolution of the Earth around the Sun is, varied by, is verified by the annual parallactic motion of the nearby stars, already mentioned by Copernicus, but not convincingly measured until 1838. But these two proofs were not available until the 19th century. It was Cardinal Roberto Bellarmina in Rome, the leading theologian of his day, who challenged Galileo to find an apodictic proof of the motion of the earth. The cardinal made very clear that he was unwilling to concede the motion of the earth in the absence of a, such an infallible proof when he added, if there were a true demonstration, then it would be necessary to be very careful in explaining scriptures that seem contrary but I do not think there is any such demonstration, since none has been shown to me. To demonstrate that the appearances are saved by assuming that the sun is at the center is not the same thing as to demonstrate that in fact the sun is in the center of the earth and the earth in its heavens. One wonders how Bellarmina would have, would have responded to these modern proofs. Suppose that the proof Foucault pendulum had been set in motion with its shifting orientation of the swing. What would Bellarmina have made of that? Well, why not suppose that the influences of the stars whirling around the Earth caused the plane of oscillation of the pendulum to rotate? This is not a frivolous way out, for it is in fact the relativistic explanation. And what if the annual stellar parallax had been found? Well, why not let each star have its own tiny epicycle revolving around each year? I think such an explanation would have naturally occurred to Bellarmine. You may immediately think of Occam's razor, that the simpler explanation would surely prevail. But remember that Occam's razor is not a law of physics. It's an element of rhetoric in the toolkit of persuasion. In the absence of new physics, a myriad epicycles might not have been an obstacle to keeping the Earth safely fixed. Of course, this is not entirely fair to Bellarmina since the time of Galileo, the background has entirely changed. I've, I'm put in mind of a totally different situation, namely the change of opinion with respect to two very famous rulings of the American Supreme Court on the question of racial segregation. The first of these was the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. In 1890, the Louisiana legislature passed a law providing for separate railway carriages for the white and colored races. The law, which required all passenger railways to provide separate cars for blacks and whites, stipulated that the cars be equal in facilities and banned blacks from sitting in the white cars and whites in the black cars. In 1892, Homer Plessy, who was seven-eighths white and one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket for a trip from New Orleans and took a vacant seat in the white-only car. It was an orchestrated case to challenge the law. Duly arrested and imprisoned, Plessy was convicted in a Los Angeles in a New Orleans court of violating the 1890 statute. He then filed a 
petition at the Louisiana Supreme Court against the trial judge, John H. Ferguson. And the case, after being lost at the state level, was in 1896 appealed to the Supreme Court, where, as Plessy versus Ferguson, it again lost. The court ruled that, while the object of the 14th Amendment was to create absolute equality of the two races before the law, such equality extended only so far as political and civil rights, such as voting and serving on juries, and not social rights, for example, sitting in a railway car one chooses. As Justice Henry Brown's opinion put it, if one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them upon the same plane. The notion of separate but equal became enshrined in US law for over half a century, during which time it became increasingly apparent that many schools, for example, were separate but demonstrably unequal. Then, in 1954, another landmark decision by the Supreme Court abruptly overturned the separate but equal doctrine. In Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, the Warren Court ruled unanimously that segregating children by race in public schools was inherently unequal and violated the 14th Amendment. In making their decision, the judges are in principle supposed to rely on the briefs submitted on each side of the argument rather than outside reading or discussions. In most respects, the issues of the law were the same in Brown versus the Board of Education as in Plessy versus per Ferguson. What had changed? Essentially, the social environment and public ideals of what was right. It was a slow change and still far from unanimous. But the judges in the Warren Court could not help but being influenced by the evolution that had taken place in the public opinion. Likewise, throughout the 17th century, the public acceptance of the Copernican cosmology was slow, far from unanimous, and based not on proofs, but on the persuasion of what was increasingly seen as a coherent system. A very important element in the acceptance was Galileo's Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, published in 1630. Though he had no solid proofs of the motion of the earth, he argued persuasively, making it intellectually respectable to believe in the Copernican system. I like to say it was the book that won the war. Galileo believed that he had two particularly persuasive arguments that Copernicus was right. One had to do with the rotation of the sun, which he had deduced from the motion of the sunspots he had observed. It is, frankly, a fallacious argument, though probably convincing to the majority of his readers. The other was the rhythm of the times, which he thought could only be explained by the motion of the earth, and he even made a snide remark against Kepler for superstitiously believing in the moon's dominion over the tides. Pope Urban VIII, who had apparently given a nod of approval to Galileo's writing a cosmological book, vetoed the idea of entitling the book on the flux and reflux of the sea because that would give too much emphasis to what Galileo considered a physical uh, proof of the Earth's motion. After all, Urban said, God in his infinite power and knowledge could have created the tides in many other ways, including some beyond human intellect. Subsequently, Galileo made a stupid misjudgment. In his book, he put the Pope's argument in the mouth of one of his characters, Simplicius, who happened to be a name of a sixth century Aristotelian commentator, but which his readers noticed as a pun on simpleton. This was undoubtedly a principal reason why Urban stopped talking with Galileo and put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. <laughs> there was a significant reason why Galileo's Dialogo did not entirely win the, the day. Note its full title, Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems. Galileo deliberately avoided another world system, one that had been proposed in 1588 by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. 
in the Taconic system, the Earth was solidly fixed in the center of the universe and the sun revolved around it, but in turn carrying the planets around the moving sun. You can see the Taconic arrangement outweighing the Copernican system in the frontispiece of the Jesuit Riccioli's Almagestum Novum. Riccioli's hefty two-volume set included a strong argument against the motion of the Earth. With the comparatively poor telescopes used by him and his contemporaries, it seemed that stars appeared not as pure points of light, but were apparently magnified dots. If the stars were at the vast distances required by Copernicus not to show an annual parallax, they had to be ridiculously huge. And a powerful group of educators in the Catholic countries, the Jesuits, promulgated Taconic geocentrism. In 1674, the English polymath Robert Hooke, who would become secretary of the Royal Society in London, summarized the state of play with the arguments. The problem of the Earth's mobility, he wrote, hath much exercised the wits of our best modern astronomers and philosophers, amongst which not with Withstanding, there hath not been any one who hath found out a certain manifestation either of the one or the other doctrine. Thus he suggested people let their prejudices reign. Hook confirms what I've been arguing, namely that the best and most persuasive reason for adopting the Copernican system up through his time was the proportion and harmony of the world. On the other side, he says, some out of a contradicting nature to their tutors, by as great a prejudice of institution, and some few others upon better reasoned grounds from the proportion and harmony of the world cannot but embrace the Copernican arguments. But, Hook allows, what way of demonstration have we that the frame in the Constitution is so harmonious according to our notion of its uh, harmony as we suppose? Is there not a possibility that things may be otherwise? Nay, is there not such a probability? I will not describe to you the method that Hook attempted to get the parallax of the star, but you can see where he put his head down here at the bottom. One of my friends said, you can tell he's not married. No wife would allow you to cut a hole through the second floor just to get your sight line up to the top. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he thought he had confirmed the, the parallax. But unfortunately for him, the much effect was much more subtle than what he imagined or uh, measured. Nevertheless, by the end of the century, the tide had begun to turn toward Copernicus. What happened between Hooke's attempted experimentum crucis in 1674 and the century's end in 1700? Isaac Newton's Principia Philosophiae in 1687 described a solar system under gravitation around a sun vastly more massive than any of the planets, yet holding them in orbit by the mysterious but math but mathematically expressed gravitational power. Even the wayward comets fell into elliptical orbits rounding the sun. Likewise, calculations showed that people would not be spun off into space by the rotation of the Earth. Here was an awesome coherency, persuasion par excellence. Copernicus was indeed on the right track. One prediction made by Newton's Principia was that the Earth, because of its rotation, would bulge out, at, should bulge out at the equator. But at the time of the publication, geodetic measurements of the Earth were not precise enough to establish the, this fact. Not until 1736, with the results from an Arctic expedition of Maupertuis, was Newton's prediction confirmed. Maupertuis became known as the man who flattened the earth. As for the motion of the earth around the sun, a phenomenon known as aberration was discovered by James Bradley and announced in 1729. But the long sought and subtle parallax, the periodic change in the positions of nearby stars remained undetected. 
So, you may have thought it was completely absurd when I asked the question, was Copernicus right? But I hope we can now realize that it is not as bizarre as it may first have appeared because for a century and a half, the question was not settled. And we can also see that cultural attitudes, especially including religious beliefs, play a significant role in what passes as a proper scientific understanding. Did the problem of overlapping magisteria fade away when, in 1838, Catholic Inquisition finally took Copernicus's book off the index of prohibited books. Tomorrow, we will have another look at this problem when we ask, was Darwin right? Thank you. He'd rather look at that than look at me. So you can go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Gingrich, for this profound and insightful lecture. And maybe the best thing I should do is just say amen and sit down because you cannot really disagree with anything here. But I really don't want to miss the opportunity to repeat and underscore two of the important insights that you have shared. The first is the observation that answering the question, was Copernicus right, from a purely scientific perspective, isn't as easy as we might think. And the second is his observation that our metaphysical perspectives, particularly our cultural and religious beliefs, have a significant effect on our scientific understanding. There is an overlap of the two magisteria of science and religion. Now, when you first heard the title of his lecture, you probably thought that's an obvious question, and what's the trick? But he showed us this afternoon that the answer isn't so easy. Galileo's early arguments, he pointed out, turned out to be incorrect. These included the rotation of the sun based on sunspots and the rhythm of the tides, which Galileo incorrectly attributed to the rotation of the earth rather than to the moon. The observations that we now consider to be the strongest supporting evidences, such as stellar parallax and the Coriolis force, as demonstrated by Foucault's pendulum, were not made until the 19th century. Now, these seemed to settle the matter at the time until the 20th century, when Albert Einstein published the theory of general relativity, which asserts that the laws of nature are equivalent in all frames of reference. That is, one cannot determine a preference for one frame of reference over another based solely on the laws of nature. In simple terms, the laws of nature alone cannot tell us whether it is the earth or the sun or neither that is stationary. Each of those frames of reference, geocentrism, heliocentrism, is equivalent to the other. We may prefer one for its mathematical or conceptual simplicity, but as Dr. Gingrich pointed out, Occam's razor is rhetoric, not a law of nature. So oddly enough, this means that today there is less compelling scientific evidence for Copernicus' hel heliocentric view than there is for the old age of the Earth. And yet, the former is virtually universally accepted while well, the latter is disputed by nearly half of all Americans. Well, to be sure, heliocentrism is not unanimously accepted. There are a few, very few to be sure, residual groups that do maintain geocentrism. Uh, if you have a chance, you might like to look up the website GalileoWasWrong.com. You might think it's a spoof, but it isn't. I have actually corresponded with its author, Robert Sungenis, at some length, to no avail. And he, he and his team are very seriously convinced of geocentrism. 
They have a related website, geocentrism.com, and they are, as we speak, actively trying to release a movie into the theaters this year or next called The Principal. Uh, not sure they will succeed. They consider that centrifugal and Coriolis forces that we consider to be fictitious or pseudo forces, they consider them to be real forces created by God. They interpret Newton's laws of motion as teaching that all celestial bodies orbit around the center of mass of the universe. And I'll leave it as an exercise to the physics students here to show why that isn't correct, or maybe it is. They quote Ernst Mach and Albert Einstein to show that the Earth is the center of mass of the universe. And you can see that from the symmetry of the universe. They kind of ignore the fact that the same is true of the sun and every other location in the universe. Well, the lesson for us here is just that this whole question, was Coper Copernicus right, isn't so easy if all you talk about is pure science. Rather, our acceptance of such answers is greatly influenced by metaphysical factors such as cultural and religious beliefs, and that is precisely Dr. Gingrich's second point that I wish to underscore. And of the many non-scientific concepts that might influence our scientific understanding, I would like to emphasize two. First is our perception of God's sense of beauty. And secondly, our perception of how God works in nature. Now, Coper Copernicus lived in an era where the dominant perspective of God's sense of beauty in creating the universe was one of the harmony of the spheres. Circular motion at a constant speed could be unending and eternal, suitable for ethereal spheres, although this ideal of platonic beauty didn't work for making accurate predictions. It led to a model to be admired, but not for practical use. Copernicus offered another type of beauty, a unification that made more physical sense, but which did not immediately improve the accuracy of the predicted positions. As Dr. Gingrich pointed out, it took time for this perspective of God's sense of beauty to be accepted. And notably, this acceptance and consequently the acceptance of heliocentrism preceded the actual scientific observations in the 19th century that provided the confirming evidence. Now today, our sense of God's beauty is often focused on mathematics. For many physicists, while there is some prejudice against accepting a theory based on its aesthetics, there is also a sense that mathematical beauty is a criterion of truth and a reliable reflection of physical reality. History shows that many predictions from mathematical symmetry and beauty have led to great discoveries. One of the most recent examples is the discovery of the Higgs boson, for which Peter Higgs and Francois Anglair shared the Nobel Prize in physics this morning. Others, like the existence of multiverses that Dr. Gingrich will discuss on Thursday afternoon, may never be resolved in our lifetime. But our sense of God's beauty in creation is a significant influence in our scientific understanding. Now, a second way in which religious belief affects our scientific understanding is our notion of how God works in nature. Now, opinions in the Christian community cover the full spectrum from deistic naturalism on one hand, to continual interventionism on the other. Now, most Christians would shy away from either of those extremes and would affirm some variation in between. Some would emphasize God's consistency in working through laws of nature, while others emphasize his miraculous acts. Now, the impact of how our perspective of how God works in nature uh, the impact of our perspective of how God works in nature is particularly relevant to the discussion of evolution, which Dr. Gingrich will address tomorrow afternoon. Those who tend toward God's consistent action in nature usually prefer evolutionary creation, while those with a preference toward some degree of miraculous intervention will lean toward progressive creation or some form of the intelligent design perspective or even young earth creationism. But how do we deal with this influence? 
Many scientists claim to divorce their religious beliefs from their scientific opinion. But one of Dr. Gingrich's key points in this series is that our metaphysical concepts, in fact, contribute significantly to our scientific opinions. Now, one way in which the scientific community works to minimize this impact is to seek consilience or a broad-based consensus in the scientific community. When many scientists from many different background beliefs come to the same conclusion of how nature behaves, there's good reason to believe that the result is independent of those background beliefs. Jitsi Vandermeer has recently discussed this in the June 2013 issue of Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith in an article titled Background Beliefs, Ideology, and Science. I urge you to read that article if you haven't, and at the ASA table outside there are, a, I believe, a few extra copies available if you don't have your own. This is also the reason why scientists are confident of their position in diverse and controversial topics such as climate change and the theory of evolution, fields in which the scientific consilience has been achieved. To conclude, Dr. Gingrich, through a series of examples from history, is bringing us to a key realization that scientific conclusions are seldom simple, indisputable ideas independent of metaphysical concepts but are strongly based on factors such as our cultural and religious beliefs. We would do well to recognize this overlap of science and religious beliefs and think carefully about the basis of our own convictions. <laughs>